This video is brought to you in partnership with Gaia.com, creating thought-provoking documentaries and programs. Throughout our ancient past, many UFO sightings and celestial visitations have been documented. The Bible includes numerous accounts detailing encounters with otherworldly beings. In the second book of the Kings, the prophet Elijah boards a fiery chariot from the skies and is carried away into the heavens, never to be seen again. Similarly, the book of Genesis tells of the patriarch Enoch, who is mysteriously taken into the heavens. The book of Ezekiel contains first-person accounts of flights over the landscape in a mysterious technological craft. Such accounts of ancient flying machines are not limited to biblical history. They can be found in the narratives of cultures all over the world. Some of the richest and most descriptive sources are to be found within the ancient Indian texts known as the Vedas. India is full of gods. There are hundreds of it. And most of them are related to the sky. They were descending from the sky. And all of these gods are linked to the extraterrestrials because they all were teachers. They all thought humans in mathematics, in calendars, and etc. The idea of chariots of the gods has come in the Bible with the prophet Ezekiel. But the prophet Ezekiel, again, you can compare to Indian chariots. You know, what the Indian gods were flying in chariots. The chariots were always Vimanas. The chariots were always what we would call space vehicle, but not motor spaceships. The chariots only had a small distance they could move in our solar system, but not to another star. These sacred texts contain many references to mysterious flying machines, known as Vamanas. The word Vimana means traversing or having been measured out. These traversing craft are described in ancient Hindu Sanskrit epics such as the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. In the Ramayana, the king of Lanka is identified as having possessed a Vimana called Ravana. The meaning of this word, the one with the terrifying roar, The Ramayana describes it in these terms. The Pushpaka Vimana, which resembles the sun and belongs to my brother, was brought by the powerful Ravana, that aerial and excellent Vimana, going everywhere at will, that chariot resembling a bright cloud in the sky. The king, Rama, got in, and at the command of the Ragira, the excellent chariot rose up into the higher atmosphere. Dr. Vyacheslav Zaitsev is the author of Temples and Spaceships, published in 1967. He refers to another astonishing text from the Ramayana. He writes, The holy Indian sages tell of two storied celestial chariots with many windows. They roar off into the sky until they appear like comets. The Mahabharata and various Sanskrit books describe these chariots at length. Powered by winged lightning, it was a ship that soared into the air, flying both to the solar and stellar regions. Eric von Daniken has made a detailed study of the ancient Vimana texts. He identifies many points of comparison between the descriptions of India's flying Vimanas and UFO sightings today. These Indian uh, descriptions 
about flying machines are not just fantasy, are not just allegories. No, they were real because the humans saw them and whole groups of humans saw them and then described what they saw. They described that one of the gods descended with the Vimana and the humans, hundreds of it, were watching them. They described that some of these Vimana Vimanas had wheels and others had no wheels. They described the noise which the Vimanas made. At least some of the Vimanas made noise. Others were quiet. So all of this, we have descriptions. Descriptions handed down and uh, uh, written by humans. Just read the book Drona Parva. It's full of these flying machines of ancient India. Professor Dr. Kanjilal, who is the Sanskrit professor of the Sanskrit College in Calcutta, a brilliant man, he has, in our modern time, translated some of these Indian Vedas in a special book with the name Flying Machine in Ancient India. And this is a proper scientific work. It's like in the Bible, for example. In the Bible, you have Moses, first book of Moses, uh, chapter 3, then verse number 27. The, the, the translation of Professor Dr. Kanjilal is the same thing. He writes, such Veda, chapter XY, first uh, XY, and so on. It's a scientific work. There is absolutely no doubt, no, for the one who knows it, that in India, flying machines were described and different types of flying machines. And there is no doubt that there were spaceships, mother spaceships, which were around the, the Earth in an orbit. The Vimanas were the small vehicles we would today call the Vimana space shuttles. You see, in orbit, you have the mother spaceship. The old Indian called the mother spaceship cities in the sky, at least in the translation. There is the almighty god Shiva. And Shiva had a flying machine, a flying bird. This flying bird uh, was Garuda. And Garuda was flying around Shiva. Now Garuda was not the normal bird because Garuda even flew to the moon. Garuda was able to fly away from our solar system. Garuda also used bombs. Garuda were bringing his master Shiva to different places in our solar system, not only on Earth. So Garuda was a kind of spaceship, space vehicle, etc. <laughs> In the West, ancient texts that describe advanced machines are generally considered as metaphorical, interpreted as fictional allusions to floating palaces and flying chariots. But is this because of the meanings of the words themselves, or because a more literal interpretation would contradict our mainstream narrative, namely, that all technology is recent and originates on Earth? What if these ancient narratives contain less metaphor and more memory than we may have presumed? How would you explain a modern aircraft or a Saturn V rocket to a prehistoric human who has never seen one before? What metaphor would you evoke to make sense of it? A large bird? A bright cloud in the sky? A fiery chariot, a comet, a fire-breathing dragon. Metaphor has to be invoked to make unknown phenomena relatable to the culture of the hero. So it is easy to see how ambiguities might arise. When you are in a spaceship which travels in a very, very high speed, the time between the spaceship and the planet is different. So an astronaut who would fly, let's say, to the next solar system, to Proxima Centauri, with a very high speed, would maybe become only a few years later, older, while on the planet Earth, 
two or three thousand years might have passed. So it might be that these so-called gods in the universe, they were traveling with high speed. And on Earth, in fact, hundreds and thousands of years passed. But we are still talking about the same gods. But that's not the final answer. That's one of the possibilities. When I speak to Western scientists, for example, Germans or Swiss in Indologists, they say, we are talking about the stories in the Veda. They say, well, it's maybe about 500 BC, not older. When I ask the same questions to Hindu professors, which know much more than our Western scientists, they are saying at least 6,000 years in the past. It's much older than what we thought. Another notable account from the ancient Hindu Vedas is in the translation of the Drona Parva, the seventh book in the Mahabharata. The book provides descriptions that sound strangely similar to modern warfare. It says, We beheld in the sky what appeared to us to be a mass of scarlet cloud resembling the fierce flames of a blazing fire. From that mass, many blazing missiles flashed and tremendous roars like the noise of a thousand drums beaten at once. And from it fell many weapons winged with gold and thousands of thunderbolts with loud explosions and many hundreds of fiery wheels. And in Drona Parva, they clearly say that one of the gods destroyed the tree city with a gigantic weapon the weapon was shining brighter than the sun. The elephants were turning around. The elephants were burning and crying. All the animals were crying and dying. Every metal which the warriors had on their, on their body, they took off and, and cried because the metal was hot, was cooking it. The birds who were flying fell down from the sky because it was all too hot. And then they say, even those who were far away, in a far distance of the weapon from heaven. The unborn child in the mother's womb died because they were all infected by the rays of gods. So in that time, nobody could have known something about radiation, about x-rays. They could not have known that even the unborn babies in the mother's womb would die because of it. But this is clearly handed down in the Drona Parva, part of the Mahabharata. The texts even detail some of the technological aspects of the Vimana. The fuel, the propulsion systems, and the design of the engines. They specify the materials needed and the various methods required to train those who pilot the different craft. In the course of time, diagrams and pictorials have been created in an attempt to keep this now esoteric knowledge alive. In some of the texts, the energy is described, the fuel, what they use as energy, but we are not able to translate everything. I know Professor Dr. Dinlep Kanjilal. He's one who can read the Sanskrit text. And he told me, we found writings about the fuel, the composition of the fuel. And there are some words which we understand. For example, part of it was quicksilver. We can translate the word quicksilver. Part of it was uh, mica. We know what mica is, okay? But other components of the fuel, we cannot translate. It, 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 some of them sound like honey. Honey, what kind of honey? There are different kinds. Something sweet, something, you know, we have no translation. If we would have the translations of all the components of these Vimana fuels, then we probably would have a, a new, a new uh, energy for our machines here. Through the dedication of pioneers like Eric von Daniken and Professor Dilipo Kanjilal, among many others, we are beginning to build a fresh understanding of the history and events of many ancient transcripts. Tantalizing carvings also allude to secrets of this forgotten technology. Carvings of Vimanas often adorn the highest point of Hindu temples and pyramids. Every Indian temple on the top has a Vimana. Now the Vimana, I said before, had different shapes, but on every top of an Indian temple, still today, 
You have a Mimana. Some of the Mimanas look like uh, today's UFOs. They had the shape round or elliptic. Other Vimanas had another form. But still on top of the Indian temple is a Vimana. And the Vimana was one of the flying machines of the Hindu gods. Vimana is what we would call today a space shuttle. It's just a small space vehicle which moves between the planet and the mother spaceship in orbit. But with the Vimana itself, you don't make spa a space travel from star to star. These diagrams are not extremely old. Some of these diagrams were created only in the 7th, 17th century. They are not thousands of years old in some of these Indian books. These uh, designers who made these diagrams, they designed it out of the old text. They read the old text, and because of these texts, they made a design. Well, it must have looked like that and that. But the fact is there were different, different types of Vimanas which looked completely different, comparable to a, a helicopter and a jumbo jet. It's not the same thing, but both machines can fly. The world's ancient texts have been passed down through the ages to reflect the history of mankind. Their careful preservation over thousands of years reflects the value and importance in which our ancestors held this sacred knowledge. India is the land of the gods. Everything is always connected together. I mean, when we hear the story of Arjuna, he was up in a mother spaceship. It's the same story as we hear from another part of the world, from Enoch, who was up there, who learned the language. It's all different names, but in the base, the same stories. Arjuna was the one who was up there in the cities of the sky. And he was there many times, not only one. Between his visits on the sky, he always returned to the earth. Arjuna even gives the name of his pilot. The pilot's name was Matali, who brought him up there. And Arjuna describes that he saw hundreds of different Vimanas up there. There were three cities in the firmament, not in heaven. Heaven can be a space of happiness. Heaven can be a place where we go after that. Heaven can even be the place where the gods rule. But here, the three cities were in the firmament. The humans observed the three cities in the firmament. They described them because they looked differently. Now, Arjuna was one of the humans who was up there in these three cities. And he describes the three cities. He describes the fight. And he describes that there were many, many Vimanas. Vimanas are different, have different shape. There is not only one type of Vimana. You see, today, we have different shapes or types of aircrafts. A helicopter is not the same thing as a jumbo jet. Or a military fighter is not the same thing as a private uh, uh, aircraft. We have different shapes in aircraft. The same thing happens in ancient India. All these Vimanas had different qualities different speed, etc. Some of the Vimanas transported 20 humans out there. Others of the Vimanas had only room for two or three humans or gods. Some of the Vimanas had wheels. With the wheels, they could land on Earth and they could move on Earth. Other Vimanas had no wheels. They could not land on Earth. They were always standing over the ground. There are differences in Vimanas. So the funny thing is, all this is Indian tradition, it's all in the Mahabharata. And on earth, there are no industries to construct Vimanas. So the whole knowledge of the Vimana comes from outside. There is no technological evolution for the Vimanas on earth. There is no report that some humans constructed Vimanas, that there was some sort of Vimana industry or an evolution in technology to create the Vimana. The Vimanas always came from the gods. And the gods again came in their mother spaceships, which the old Indian call cities in the sky. <laughs> Every god who landed at some place, the place on earth became holy. And the humans were happy to be visited and teached by the gods. In honor of the gods, the humans made 
Templos. Always like in Maya land, Tikal. Tikal, you have a gigantic pyramid because the gods landed one year. In old India, it's the same situation. They constructed pyramids which are comparable to the pyramids in Central America, not comparable to the pyramids in Egypt. The pyramids in Egypt had this form of a triangle, not the pyramids in India or the pyramids in Central America. They look like towers. And the pyramids in Egypt, they have no sculptors on it, no heads, no design, nothing. But the pyramids in India and the pyramids in Central America, they are full of heads and sculptors and chiselings and writings, etc. The flying machines owned by the gods in the Vedic texts were powered by technology described as superior to any existing technology on Earth today. Yet we can find similarities between our current space technology and the descriptions of ancient texts. The presence of loud rumbling sounds as fiery chariots blasted back into the skies. The visual descriptions of a scorching heat source and of craft appearing like comets all match the modern phenomenon of rockets. Are these similarities pure coincidence? Many think not. All these stories are not mythologies or allegories. You know, a mythology is something which once was reality, which the following generations cannot understand. I give you an example. Imagine that our planet Earth would be destroyed. For whatever the reason is, it doesn't matter. And a few people would survive, let's say, somewhere in the high Andes or in Tibet. Now, what would these few uh, humans do? They want that the human race survive, so they make children. Now imagine there is a father and he has his two-year-old boys on his knees. And why? He's talking to his boys, a gigantic eagle flies over the valley. And the father says to his boy, look my son, in my time there were birds, they were a hundred times bigger than that eagle up there in the sky. Humans were sitting in the, in, in the womb in the belly of, the, of these uh, birds. There were little windows. The humans were looking down. And faster than an arrow, these gigantic birds were flying over the big waters. They came to a country which had houses. Their houses were so high, they were scratching the clouds. Now one generation passes. The boy becomes a father, and he has now his boy on his knees. And again, an eagle flies over the valley. Now what would the father say to his boy? You won't believe it, my son. Your grandfather told me once that there were birds which were 100 times bigger than that eagle up there, that humans were sitting inside the birds. So it's only two generations, and from the reality of our flying aircraft becomes a mythology. Mythology was always a truce, not in the detail, not precise, and not in the dating, but mythology always have cores of truth. And when the ancient Indians describe flying machines, Vimanas, and they describe different flying machines, that was true. They even say that there was no technology on earth to make these flying Vimanas. Or when in the, in the Drona Parva, they describe atomic weapons, the sun, a light brighter than the sun, the elephants were dying, etc. That was true. It was not an allegory. Not just myths, just don't not happen. Myths always have a true core. All the gods in our so-called mythologies are related together. Mythology was once reality, and the different people came up with different names, but the meaning behind it is the same. For example, I know from the Maya literature, at least in the Maya, I told you the books were destroyed, but new books were written after the destruction, destruction the so-called Chilambalam books. And there, the, the Maya priests tell us about the destruction of the earth by a gigantic flood. But the same thing you can read in Plato. Plato is Greek. Now between the Maya, Central America, and Plato, Greece, are 15,000 kilometers and the Atlantic Ocean. 
So there was no direct connection, but they hand down the same story because it was the same story, just written by different people. Now you never know at what time it happened. Compare it again to Christianity. In Christianity, we have an example which we say Jesus Christ was living in Jerusalem. And we can date Jerusalem more or less 2,000 years in the past. We can even make clear the location. Jerusalem is in today's land of Israel. Now, the message of Jesus went out over the planet. And maybe 1,000 years after Jesus, in Africa, a tribe hears for the first time about Jesus' messages. And now they start to paint and to construct a church in honor of Jesus. It's the same thing in old India. Once these gods were a reality, they were extraterrestrials, they were teachers. Now the people separated, spread out throughout the planet Earth. And they took their so-called myths, myths, in reality, stories with them. And they rewrote them with other names. But it's all the same story. The gods, descended in all the cultures were extra extraterrestrials. Could these familiar sounding descriptions really be a literal transcription of events documented by our ancient ancestors? Human history is replete with unanswered questions. Most scientists admit that as a species we have barely scratched the surface when it comes to understanding the true nature of our reality, our origins, and our potential. Perhaps one day, the human race will finally unfold all the answers to these fundamental questions. Thank you for watching The Fifth Kind. We hope you enjoyed this thought-provoking program brought to you in association with Gaia.com. To see more documentaries, interviews, and original shows, follow your curiosity and visit our all-new featured episodes portal at Gaia.com forward slash portal forward slash the fifth kind. If you like our work and you'd like to know whenever we publish our latest videos, it's really important that you click the bell icon and turn on channel notifications just next to the subscribe button. Also, please like and share this video and help make sure this type of content stays around and is available for others who may be seeking it.